Good morning. Welcome to First Lutheran Church here in Beaver Dam. It's a great day to worship. I'm glad that you're with us. Welcome all of you, however you are watching us and participating in worship. Today is December 6th. It's the second Sunday of Advent. And uh, so again, our theme is Unraveled, and we'll talk today a little bit about grief and how in the world and unraveling and injustice and uh, we'll talk about grief. A couple of announcements. One is uh, our tree lighting and ornament exchange will be uh, next Sunday, uh, December 13th and the 20th, 6.30. So uh, next Sunday we'll be having uh, the tree lighting uh, ceremony and an ornament exchange and some uh, treats. And then the next Sunday, just an ornament exchange, probably some singing. Uh, we'll be distancing from one another with face masks, following all those safe protocols. Christmas Eve, 4 o'clock, we'll have worship will be uh, Facebook, uh, our church website, and YouTube. And then at 10.30, lessons and carols will be on the radio. Christmas Day, 10 o'clock, live stream worship right here, Christmas Day. So... Uh, as we prepare for Christmas, let us prepare for worship. Come, join the journey of Jesus. Walking in our own styles, at our own speeds, but we come to join the journey. Come as we walk towards God's future for us, a future, uh, of, a future with risk, a future adventure that demands endurance and patience, a future that offers enrichment and excitement without false claims of being easy, a future of discipleship. We come to join the journey of Jesus today. God, as we approach the end of the year, life seems so dreary and feels so weary. We see the reality of the world, hunger, poverty, 
loneliness, disease, and emptiness, and despair. But despite our best efforts, nothing seems to change, and we're ready to give up. Forgive us. In this time of Advent, we pray that you would enable us to watch for signs of where you are trying to break through the tinsel and glitter we use to mask our pain. Help us to face reality with patience and hope instead of becoming indifferent to the world's evil. Empower us to prepare for Christ's coming by cleaning up the clutter of our lives and creating a welcoming space for your presence in our lives. Hear the good news. God has forgiven each one of us and calls us to take part in the story of God's love and care. Christ calls us to join the journey, enable us to begin and again and again. Thanks be to God. God who comes, we pray that your spirit would revive our spirits. In the light of the Advent candles, we pray that your word would rekindle our visions. In this season of Advent, prepare us to receive you as the one who comes as the babe of Bethlehem and who comes again as the King of Kings. Lighting the Advent candles. Today we will light two candles. The first candle is the candle burning bright, a flame warm and bright, a candle of hope. Today the candle now burning, the second candle of flame strong and sure, reminds us that God's love will always endure. Keep love like an ocean, steady as a tide, great love which comes to us with arms open wide. A reading from Isaiah, the 40th chapter. God's people are comforted. Comfort, oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill made low. An uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, Cry out! And I said, Why shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. 
Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. Here ends the reading. The message today is based on the reading from 2 Samuel chapter 21, beginning at verse number 1. Now there was a famine in the days of David for three years, year after year, and David inquired of the Lord. The Lord said, There is blood guilt on Saul and on his house, because he put the Gibbonites to death. So the king called the Gibbonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibbonites were not of the people of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. Although the people of Israel had sworn to spare them, Saul had tried to wipe them out in his zeal for the people of Israel and Judah. David said to the Gibbonites, What shall I do for you? How shall I make explanation that you may bless the heritage of the Lord? The Gibbonites said to him, It is not a matter of silver or gold between us and Saul or his house. Neither is it for us to put anyone to death in Israel. He said, What do you say that I should do for you then? They said to the king, The man who consumed us and planned to destroy us so that we should have no place in the territory of Israel. Let seven of his sons be handed over to us, and we will impale them before the Lord at Gibeon on the mountain of the Lord. The king said, I will hand them over. But the king spared Mesopotheth, the son of Saul's son Jonathan, because of the oath of the Lord that was between them, between David and Jonathan, son of Saul. The king took the two sons of Raspath, daughter of Asia, whom she bore to Saul, Amorni and Mepatheth, and the five sons of Merab, daughter of Saul, whom she bore to Adriel, so of Bazalia the Methapathite. He gave them into the hands of the Gibbonites, and they impaled them on the mountain before the Lord. The seven of them perished together. They were put to death in the first days of harvest, at the beginning of barley harvest. Then Rizpath, daughter of Ayaz, took a sackcloth and spread it on a rock for herself from the beginning of the harvest until the rain fell on them from the heavens. She did not allow the birds of the air to come onto the bodies by day or the wild animals by night. When David was told what Vizpath, the daughter of Ayah, the concubine of Saul, had done, David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of his son Jonathan from the people of Jeb Gilead, who had stolen them from the public square of Bethshan, where the Philistines had hung them up on the day the Philistines killed Saul on Gaboa. He brought them from there, the bones of Saul and the bones of his son Jonathan, and they gathered the bones of those who had been impelled. They buried the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan in the land of Benjamin and Zila, in the tomb of the father Kish, They did all that the king had commanded. After that, God heeded supplications for the land. Here ends the reading. Thank you, Bob, for reading that lesson. 
That second Samuel lesson does not appear, thank goodness, in our lectionary reading that we would have to hear that lesson every three years or so. It's a very tough, difficult lesson to listen to. It is a story of, of Rizpa and her sons and, and grandchildren in grieving and, and undeservable grieving in death. We hear in this story, this is when, you know, the, sewing, the story or the saying about paying the, um, the debts of, of your forefathers or paying the bloodshed of the sins of your forefathers. And we see in this text that that's exactly what happened. But let's begin at the beginning a little bit. King David was in reign and before David was Saul. But David was a good king. He was concerned about the people's welfare and health and only went to the Lord when it really related to the well-being of the people. And there was a drought for three years. There was this famine. And so David was wondering, is it something that's just sort of natural or just sort of the cycle of the earth? Or is it really the sins of the people? Went to the Lord to seek why this famine, why this drought. And the Lord simply explained to him it was because of Saul and his blood guilt, the, the injustice that Saul did to the Gibeonites. And that is a time in our Bible in those early years where there were uh, offerings, there were animal sacrifice offerings and even human sacrifice offerings. And of course, you know, with Christ that came, he would be the ultimate, one-time, ultimate sacrifice. He gave himself for our sins. No more, no more superficial offerings on the altar. But Christ died for us. But back to the story, back in that time, someone had to pay the sins of the forefathers. Someone had to pay for Saul trying to massacre all of those Gibeonites. See, uh, uh, Joshua, about 400 years earlier, made it possible, had this, had this agreement that they would be fine, they, they would, could live in peace with the Israelites and with the people. And Saul tried to change that, tried to eradicate them from the earth. So David wanted to make it right. Wanted this drought to get over with. What can we do for you? And they didn't want money, and they didn't want more bloodshed, more death. But they did ask for Saul's children and grandchildren. It just happened to be that um, Ritzva had two, two sons that, that were taken and died, along with five grandchildren. All seven of them were, um, were killed and hung out to dry, as they say, out for public humiliation, out for the world to see. Perhaps the message is sent, don't do this or else you, this could be you, trying to prove a point. We hear about Rizpha in, Rizpha in this story that you know, she is... The, kind of the second wife or the power, one of the powerless wives of Saul. She may be uh, a small person when it comes to strength and, and what she can and cannot do. She's powerless in this. She couldn't save her sons. She couldn't do really anything to keep them alive. When you first read this story, it, it should make you, you know, recoil a bit and pull you back. And think about the loss of, of human life or someone you know and love, your own children, sons, daughters, somebody who is close to you, someone who suffered an unjust death. It didn't need to be. It shouldn't have been. Why should they pay the cost or the price of somebody else's wrongs? We see that in the world today. Innocent people die for somebody else's mistakes. Why? 
Why, O oh Lord, why are innocent people dying? So we see in this story, then and Rizpa goes to that mountain and she spends three, four, five months out there on a sackcloth on the ground protecting these, these men from birds by day and wild animals by night. She can't lift them up and bring them down and give them a proper burial. She can protect their, their dignity by keeping creatures and things away from them. But her public grieving, she perhaps is wailing and crying, perhaps attending to it the best that she can. Her public grieving has been noticed and King David was told about it and he did. He was moved to go and help her, bring down those, those men and give them proper burials with dignity. I think about all the people who have lost innocent lives, children, sons, daughters, loved ones, children of classrooms, children, just young people died innocently for what? Maybe an accident, maybe a disease, maybe a wrongful shooting, something. They died for the for the sins of their forefathers and mothers. They were just in the wrong place at the wrong time, perhaps. Perhaps it was who they're related to, what they looked like, what they stood for, what they believed. They were handed over to pay the price of somebody else's wrongs. Is that not true in our culture, to our world today, that people go to prison for things they've never done? They would just look like someone else. They were with the wrong crowd at the wrong time. Public grief. This topic, grief, kind of fits into our unraveling. And, and even 2020, when we think about our lives unraveling, so much loss. So much pain, so much grieving. People lost their life to a pandemic, right? To COVID-19. Why, oh why? Old and young, healthcare workers, first responders. They just happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. Maybe trying to help somebody, they got sick. Or these these terrible rioting and shootings, Black Lives Matter. Innocent people die because of their skin color or because of what someone else has done. They were wrongfully accused. I thought about all the public outrage and grief, right? We've seen that in, on television and articles. And, and can we learn from that? We may not be able to save someone from dying, but in that way, once they're already gone and wrongfully accused, but can we join in this grief action? Can we stop the next death, the next faults of someone being falsely accused? I think about like uh, mothers against drunk driving. Those are moms that lost children. And out of their grief, their grief put into action, they organized MAD, started educating, try to get people to not drink and drive. Or there are other things that you can look, you can look online, it's like they're endless. Uh, helmets for kids who are riding bicycles and, and playing sports or car seats, seat belts. Innocent people died to car injuries. Safer helmets for kids who play football. The list goes on and on. People were suffering because of these, these things that happened. It wasn't the child's decision. They didn't have a say in it at all. But because of the grief, because grief in action, we can join these individuals 
We can fight against injustice, wrongful, wrongfully accused people. We see in this story, although she may have been small and powerless, but her grief and her grief in action gave her strength. It moved those men from public humiliation and display to proper burial. When, O oh Lord, when you come, why, O oh why, must people suffer? How long must this be going on? So many innocent lives lost. So many people wrongfully accused. Come, Lord Jesus. Come. We need you. You can hear the cries of your people. Help us in our time of need. Amen.
We believe in God, the one who comes before us and goes behind us, creating life and opportunities to love and care for the world. We believe in Jesus Christ who walks with us into real life each day. He is God, yet human like us and experienced all life's joys and pains and challenges like we do. But his love is so great that not sin nor suffering nor even death could stop it. Today the love of Jesus lives and continues to bring new life to the world. We believe in the Holy Spirit who comes like the wind and blows in and through us to bring God's power and light to all the world. The Spirit breathes life into us, the body of Christ we call the church, and enables us to follow the way of Christ. We believe in God who goes before and behind, with, in, and through us, bringing hope and life and newness to the world. We pray for all those needing you today, those who are personally fighting the diagnosis of COVID-19 virus at home, in the hospital, or in a rehab facility. We pray for Bishop Joy's husband, Darren, and their daughter, Julia. Give them courage, strength, patience, and signs of your love for them. Those who are separated from their families and friends due to the pandemic. Those who struggle with their health, especially Darlene, Betty, Lisa, Vern, Jerry, Bev, Justin, Tina, Richard, Eileen, Wendy, Jensen, Brenda, Dorothy, Sue, Landon, Amy, Sally, Davy, Dale, Tim, Ellen, Bill, Oliver, Judy, John, Christina, Ron, and Jackie. May they know deep within their hearts you unite all of us in your love. Those who give themselves despite risk, nurses, technicians, facility cleaners, food service workers, shelf stockers, and checkout clerks, doctors, EMS, and so many others. We give thanks for their selflessness. Guard each one. Those who are alone and isolated, particularly in this season of joy and celebration, help them to know they are never alone. You are with them always. Those who make decisions for the good of all, give them wisdom, creativity, courage, and serenity. Those who mourn the loss of loved ones, may the memories, stories, tears, and laughter bring comfort and peace. You are the God who hears our sighs and counts our tears. We are filled with thankfulness for your promise of coming to be one in one of us in the presence of Jesus, who taught us how to live and love. We place all of our prayers before you, for you are the God of mercy and grace. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Let us give thanks for our offerings, the offerings that come to support the mission of this congregation. Almighty God, you made us who we are. We offer all of ourselves to you. Take our talents, our energy, and our joy, and use us to share your love. Magnify the gifts that we will offer before you today and to spread the peace, the peace within the world. Amen. Amen. Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice. He bled out for us, for our sins, and he offered a way for us to have eternal life through him, in him. It is this day that we do celebrate Holy Communion, generally not, but because of the grief and the topic in Christ being the 
ultimate sacrifice, we remember his body and blood poured out for us. In the night in which our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. He gave thanks, giving it to all to eat, saying, This is my body broken and given for you. Eat and do this for the remembrance of me. And then after supper, he took the cup, said, This cup is a new covenant, my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink, drink and do this in remembrance of me. He said that I'm always with you and to the end of time. And then it is that that he teaches us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. If you are at home and you're listening and you want to receive the body and blood of Christ, know that the table extends into your home. It is spiritual food and drink. Take some bread and some drink and know that Christ is with you. It's in these words that Christ is with you. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Receive a benediction. Go in the power of the Spirit to discover where God is breaking into the world, into your world, with good news. With why, uh, we go with eyes wide open, anticipating the unexpected in the ordinary. Christ has come, Christ will come again, and Christ goes with you now and stays with you forever in your journey. Amen. Amen. Go in peace, the journey continues.
And all will see how great, how great.